Welcome to ALC at Home. My name's Hannah and I have the awesome privilege of being part of the team here at Abundant Life Church. This is our online service specifically catered for our online congregation. So if this is your first time tuning in, then welcome. It is so good to have you here. If you've been part of our online congregation, then welcome back. We're so glad you decided to tune in this morning. I know we have a great word for you in store today from Pastor Hamish, but just before we get into that, there are a few things that I'd like to go over. Here here in Wellington, um, we are in level two again, so we're able to gather in person with our 50 limit um, for gathering. So if you'd like to be part of that, if you're watching from Wellington and you'd like to be part of that, you can always um, register before Sunday so that you have your spot there ready for you. Um, it also means that we can now film in our studio. We are still working on it. We are still um, putting bits and bobs together. So you will see our online service develop as the weeks go by. But hey, um, we still want to connect and um, be in touch with our online congregation. So I, if you have any questions, then feel free to email us at info at alc.com and uh, someone will surely get back to you. We'd also love to pray and be part of your life. So if you have any prayer requests, please go ahead and email them to prayer at alc.com and one of our teams from our really, really amazing prayer team will um, get back to you via email. Uh, another way you can connect is through our slider Q&A that we usually have on Sundays at 7.30 p.m. This Sunday, however, we will not be having our um, slider Q&A, but we will be back with it next Sunday, so make sure you're here for that. Before we go into the word, I just want to talk a little bit about giving. Here at ALC, we encourage you to choose a Christian organization or um, charity of your choice and give to that. Uh, we also encourage you to be givers of hope in your community. It could be something as simple as picking up the phone and calling your loved ones or taking someone out for a coffee if you're in a place where you can do that or meeting up with someone and just giving them your time. I think during these uncertain times that uh, it's really important for us to be the light during the darkness, represent Jesus' light and give people hope. If you do still wish to give to ALC, then our giving details will be in the description below. But hey, it's time for us to go into the Word. I know Pastor Hamish has another really good sermon for you prepared in our um, Hope in the Dark series. Uh, we are going through the, ch uh, the chapters of Mark. Uh, so bring out your iPads, your notebooks, whatever you take notes on and get ready for a great word. Hey, welcome to ALC Online. It's so good to have you with us. You know, I, I trust this finds you well, wherever you may be. I, I trust that you are able to look back and, and see something of the goodness and the faithfulness of God in your life. It's so good that, to be able to do that because when we do that, what happens is it, it raises our hope levels. It encourages us and inspires us because we can see that in the midst of whatever we're in or perhaps whatever we're going into, we, we have a reference point. Hey, God was good then. He's going to be good today. God was good then. God is going to be good today tomorrow. And it just allows us to, to keep our eyes focused on the goal of faith, to keep on that trajectory of going up rather than, than feeling like we're, we're marking time or going down. So, so as we open up the scriptures together, it's, it's my hope that, that God's going to speak to you, God's going to encourage you, and God is going to strengthen you in your faith, your hope, and your love as we continue to let Him do His work in us so that we might continue His work in the world. So uh, without any further ado, let's open up the Scriptures. We're continuing uh, our series, Hope in the Dark, where we are looking at, at what does it mean to live out of God's kingdom? What does it mean to live out of the knowledge that if God be for us, who can be against us? That if God is faithful then, He's faithful now. Uh, so that we might continue to overcome that struggle that we all face to live our lives in reaction to circumstance rather than out of the fullness of God's kingdom. And of course, we are continuing where we left off last time, Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 30. And as, as you open up the scriptures, the notes will be uh, in the comment section. There will be a link there to the Bible app. Uh, maybe you use a physical Bible, whatever it is, however you take notes, uh, that's great. But as, as you open up, I want to pose this question to you. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? You see, it's really easy to say Jesus is Lord or Jesus is the Messiah or Jesus is. But 
it's another thing to live out of that. And it's the way that we live that really tells us who we say Jesus is. So just bear that in mind as we open up the scriptures. So uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 22. When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch the man. And, uh, <coughs> pardon me. And they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and he asked, can you see anything now? The man looked around. Yes, he said, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Now, <clears throat> let's just pause there for a moment. You know, there's a couple of things about this passage, which I think is worth just noting. The first is, is quite simply, um, the suggestion is this man was not born blind. Think about it. If he was born blind, he would not know what things were supposed to look like. But the moment Jesus laid hands on him um, and, and, and his eyes opened, he said that I, he could identify people, and, but they look like trees. So he had, he had frames of reference. Uh, so it suggests that he wasn't born blind. But the other thing to note is the way that Jesus heals. I mean, it's so easy to try and get into slick formulas the way that we, we live out of our faith. Oh, in this situation, you do this. If you're going to pray with someone, you do that. And yet here's Jesus, you know, he, he just heals multiples of ways. He spits in people's eyes like this. kind. Sometimes he makes mud. Sometimes he speaks. And I just say that because you know what? There isn't a formula. It's called faith. There's no right way to pray. There's no wrong way to pray. When you are praying for healing for yourself, when you're praying for your needs, we're praying for others. You know, God hears your heart, not simply the words. So don't get locked into, I've got to pray a particular way. And, and I say that because over recent times, you know, talking with some people, it, it's, it's become evident that some people feel that their prayers are uh, inadequate because they don't feel eloquent or, or they feel that their prayers are, are not going to achieve anything because they don't use the right words or, or anything like that. And I just want to encourage you, you know, it's not about what you say. It's where it comes from, the heart and to whom it's addressed, the Lord. And I think that's one reason Jesus heals in different ways to remind us there's no formula. It comes out of a relationship more than anything else. Anyway, Mark carries on. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away, saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. <clears throat> now, I just think this is really, really quite a significant passage, because this is the only place in the Gospels where you see Jesus uh, praying for somebody, asking, how did it go? and then laying hands on them again. This is the only place where it's like Jesus has two bites at the cherry, so to speak. Now, we could speculate a whole lot of things about why and everything else, and I don't think that's relevant. I don't think it's helpful, but I think Mark's trying to make the point here that whatever the reason this man was blind, whatever the cause of it, the, 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 the stronghold behind it was sufficiently strong that Jesus, <coughs> had to had to persist and but in his persistence he completely restored and the man could see everything clearly you know Jesus was not overcome Jesus uh, who was Lord laid hands out on the guy couldn't see clearly so he did it again and is completely restored demonstrating that he has absolute power and authority over all things nothing is too difficult for him. No stronghold, no, no illness, no, no powers and principalities are too strong for Jesus. And I think that Mark records it here to make that point uh, for you and I, but it comes via his audience in the church in Rome. Imagine there you are in the church in Rome and, you, and you're being persecuted, you're feeling overwhelmed and you're wondering, you know, is Jesus enough? Mark's reminding them, you know, you may feel like the enemy is winning the battle, but Jesus is still in control and Jesus will come through. Keep trusting him. Keep seeking him. He will be victorious. And I just want to encourage you. I don't know what's going on in your life, but, but for some of you, I have the sense as, as I've been praying for you this week that, that some of you have been struggling with, with, with things for quite some time. Attitudes, behaviors, hurts, um, what feels like road blockages. And, and it's almost like, well, this is, my, this is it for me. This is as good as it's going to get. This is my limit. 
And I want to encourage you, don't settle. Don't settle. Don't never settle for less than Jesus' best for you. Never give up. You know, whatever it is that you're struggling with, be honest with the Lord. Lord, I haven't received it all yet. I'm not, I'm not walking in the fullness. I'm not experiencing. And let him bring, bring the victory into your life. A breakthrough is coming. A breakthrough will come because what Jesus began, he sees through to its completion. It's not over. Jesus is still in control. And then Mark carries on. Jesus and disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter replied, You are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, here's what you need to know about this passage. And, and, and this is, in many ways, we've been building up to this over the last few weeks. I want you to understand that Jesus isn't just walking along and just turns randomly to the disciples and say, Oh, by the way, who do you think I am? It's, 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 nothing could be further from the truth. This is where he is, Caesarea Philippi. This is where he's been. He's been, you know, there's Bethsaida um, where he said to the guy um, where he just healed that guy. They've been carrying on up to here to Caesarea Philippi. This is Nazareth. So this is where most of Jesus' ministry that we've read about to date has been taking place all around this area here. Now he's been walking up to here. And here's what you need to know about Caesarea Philippi. Okay, Caesarea Philippi is right up on, on, the, on the border. Um, today, it's, it's in the, what we would call the Golan Heights. This is Lebanon over here. It's, it's, it's right up uh, on the border. It's about as far away as you could get from Jerusalem and, st uh, and still be in Israel. So you've got Damascus over here um, and, and all that. And here's what you need to know ab about this place, okay? That the River Jordan, significant river, um, has its headwater here in, in Caesarea Philippi. The, if you know anything about um, the River Jordan, it's a significant river in, in terms of uh, its spiritual significance for Israel, for, um, for, for Jews. Remember, it's the, it's the river that demarcated the Promised Land from the wilderness. It, it, it has spiritual significance. Uh, it, it's, it's where they, Jesus is baptized. It's where John the Baptist was, was baptizing people for repentance. It has two headwaters, one here and the other by Dan, which is just right next to Caesarea Philippi. And it has its headwaters here. Now, here's, what, here's the significance of, of Caesarea Philippi. Okay? It's, it's known as the gateway of Hades, the gateway of of the underworld. There was this huge temple built on the site right here, a huge temple to, uh, to, the, to, to the god Pan, who is the god of fertility, who's the god of nature, who's the god of, uh, of all of those sorts of things. And what would happen is people would come up here and they would offer sacrifice in the mouth of this cave, where you've got the headwater of the River Jordan, Gateway to Hades, you've got this huge temple um, to, to, uh, to the Greek god Pan. Uh, as I say, fertility, nature, all of those sorts of things. Not only that, here you've got, um, you've got King Herod the Great. You know, Herod is the guy who tried to kill all the babies when Jesus was born to try and, and get rid of the Messiah. He built a huge temple here to worship Caesar because Caesar worship was a, was a big thing. Caesars were treated as gods. So this is what's called um, Caesarea, Caesar Philippi. And he built this huge um, palace temple as an act of worship towards Caesar. There was 14 other known temples to other deities, other, other religious gods, uh, Roman gods, Greek gods, Syrian gods in, in this whole area of Caesarea Philippi. And so here's Jesus, who's deliberately made his way from Nazareth, from this area of Galilee, to where he's standing in the shadow of, of the significant Greek gods, Roman gods, and Syrian gods. And he's, he's standing where the, in, in this area called the, the Gateway of Hades. And he turns to his disciples and say, Who do you say I am? I love the way that Matthew 
records it. In Matthew's gospel, he, he, he says, to, says to them, who do you say I am? Um, and, and Peter says, well, you're the Messiah. And look how Jesus um, responds. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. All of the powers of Pan, all of the powers of Caesar, all of the, the powers of those 14 other um, gods of those temples. Here he is, the gateway to Hades, saying nothing will conquer the church that he's birthing on the, and building on the faith or the confession of Peter. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. You see, it's, it's, not, it's not insignificant that he's deliberately journeyed as far away from Jerusalem as you can get and still be in the Holy Land. It's not insignificant that he's journeyed to this place which represents all of the powers and principalities uh, coming together. As I say, Greek gods, Roman gods, Syrian gods, the gods of fertility, the gods of nature. And what's he been doing up until this point? demonstrating his authority over nature. And so he's come to this point where they all come together, come to the place where the headwater of the Jordan, uh, one of the significant headwaters of the Jordan flows to say, you know what? I have a power and authority. Don't, these things will not overpower you. These things will not conquer you. These things cannot stop the church that I am building. So take heart, be encouraged. And, and, and I just think that's really significant. You see, what happens, what, what, one of the things that's so easy to miss is that uh, uh, when you read the Gospel of Mark, this is the, uh, basically the halfway point. Up until now, we've had this, we've had the Mark just, Jesus has been on a journey to, towards this place. And, now, and, and along the way, Mark's been helping the, the church in, in uh, Rome and through them, you and I, understand the disciples' struggles to recognize who Jesus is. Now they recognize him and everything's going to change because from here on, he's going to go from the outermost parts of the kingdom of, of, of the Holy Land and journey all the way down to Jerusalem. Over the, next, over the remains of Mark's Gospel, the centre of it all. And along the way, what we're going to see is now that the struggle shifts from the disciples um, being able to understand who Jesus is to being able to get their heads around, because he's the Messiah, he's going to suffer. And by virtue of his suffering, you and I are going to suffer as well. And Mark's writing to remember, to, re to encourage the church who's, who's suffering at this point, to remind them you're, you're walking in the very footsteps of Jesus, but take heart in the midst of that. It will not win. Your, your oppressors will not win. The enemy will not win. Jesus is standing in the, in the, in the shadows of, of these significant deities, the gateway of hell, and saying, I have authority over this, and my church will not win be overcome. I just think that's really important for us to, to get our heads around. Everything's been building to this point to understand who Jesus is. And as we're going to see over the, as we begin to unfold the rest of the Gospel of Mark, the, the challenge for you and I is how do we live out of that? How do we live out of our faith? How do we live in a way that, that, bears, uh, that, that bears the hope that everything that we've just been talking about means for us? That the powers of hell will not overcome us. That the enemy cannot stop us. That no matter what we go through in suffering, that Jesus has already gone before us, already made a way and already won a victory. And so raises the question, so how will we live? How will we live in response to that? And the reason I, I, this short little passage is so significant is it just helps us understand the context of Mark and yours and my context. That no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what we're going through, no matter the powers, no matter the suffering, no matter the persecution that comes against us, Jesus has won a victory. And all we have to do is to learn to live out of it, even in the midst of difficulty. But to do that, we have to answer the question, who do you say I am? Which begs the question, what does this mean for us today? 
who do you say I am? Well, the reason I, 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 I sort of took a little bit of time and I want to show you this map and, and the nature of the journey, how he started here, did all these miracles of nature here, then and in the, in the shadow of the God of nature said, don't, I've got complete authority. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be anxious. Recognize who I am. Peter declares who Jesus is and now he's making this journey down to the center of it all. It helps us understand something really significant and it's simply this. Faith is a process, not an event. Faith is a process, not an event. You see, I think what happens is we've got so caught up uh, in, in our faith that we forget that it's, it's to be lived. It's not something that happened. We talk about when I came to faith or when I met Jesus. And we, we, we use a vocabulary that speaks of, a, of event, not process. And as a consequence of, of confusing um, that, that whole, the, the nature of faith and not recognizing it's a process is that we, it's very easy to be discouraged. It's very easy to succumb to the temptation to, to, to give up, to be overwhelmed, to live a life that reacts to circumstance rather than responds out of faith. You see, the healing of, the, of, of this man born blind makes this point very, very clearly, I think. Here's Jesus. He says, you know, he, he spits on him, lays hands on him, and then he says to the guy, so... What do you see? And he says, I see men walking like trees. And then Jesus says, OK, let, let me do something. And then he, he speaks to him, lays hands on him again. And, and he goes from being able, to, he, he's gone from being blind to seeing men walking like trees to being able to see clearly. It just helps us understand that the moment our eyes are opened in faith to Jesus, it's the beginning of a process. That, is, that needs to be lived, that needs to, uh, to, to, to work its, its way into our life and, and shape us. And we can't just treat it as an event. Oh, well, I've met Jesus. Life is good. On I go. Because if we do, we're going to miss so much of what God has for us. I'm reminded of when God was preparing the Israelites to move into their promised land, to move from the wilderness uh, the will, where they wrestled with who is God and what does it mean to live in right relationship to Him into the fulfillment of, of the God's promise for them. And this is what Moses says in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you're about to enter and occupy, He will clear away many nations ahead of you. The Hittites, the, the Gershites, the Amorites, the uh, Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jezebites. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and you conquer them, you must completely destroy them. Make no treaties with them and show them no mercy. So God's saying, you know, I'm taking you into the promised land and your enemies are greater than you. But let me help you get rid of them. And then he goes on. Perhaps you'll think to yourself, how can we ever conquer these nations that are so much more powerful than we are? But don't be afraid of them. Just remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all, and to all in the land of Egypt. The Lord your God will drive these nations out ahead of you little by little. You will not clear them away all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you. So here's God saying to the Israelites and through them making a huge point for you and I today. I'm going to take you into a promised land and you're going to face many temptations and many enemies there. And, 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 and unless you overpower them and to do that, you're going to need my cooperation. You're going to need me to go before you. You cannot do it on yourself. Because if you try and do it on yourself, they'll overpower you. You'll make treaties with them. You'll show them mercy. And, and they will make you captive. But here's what I'm going to do. If you trust me, I'm going to go before you. And little by little, I will drive them out. Why? Because if I did it all at once, the wild animals would just multiply too quickly. And now you'd have another problem. In other words, he's saying to, to you and I today, the moment you come to faith, it's the beginning. It's not an event. It's a process. The start of a process. And for you to overpower the temptations that are going to come your way for the rest of your life, for you to, to, to be able to triumph over sin, 
You need me to work in your life. You cannot do it by yourself because if you do, you're going to make a treaty with it. You're going to compromise. You're going to, well, and you're going to excuse things. And the process goes little by little. I remember when I became a Christian, the first, one of the first things that, that, that God helped me overcome was my smoking. When I, I smoked before I became a Christian. Um, and, and God helped me overcome it just like that, little by little. And then we went on to another thing, little by little. little by, the, and, and God could have done it all at once, made me clean, made me perfect, dealt with my anger, dealt with my lust, dealt with all of these things in an instant. But he didn't because he understood that, that if he got rid of them in an instant, then the enemy would be, find it easier to overpower me because there'd be so much space for him to work in my life. I would be like a blank canvas. Remember Jesus says, you know, when the house is swept clean, if it's not filled with the things of God, then the enemy comes back sevenfold. Same thing. You see, faith is not an event. It's a process. It's something that, that starts when you accept Jesus and continues on little by little. And this is why this is really important. Character is built the same way. It's not built over time. and it's, it's built over time and not in an instant. I, and when Paul was speaking of his young protege, Timothy, who was the pastor of the largest church in the then known world in Ephesus, uh, historians say there was about 50,000 people there. As he was setting him in place to, to lead that church, this is how he speaks of him and, and um, in, in, two, in, in um, Philippians 2, sorry, you know Timothy has proved himself like a son with his father. He has served with me in preaching the good news. In other words, there's been a process. His character has been forged over time, not in an instant. It's, it's been, he's had to prove the character that Paul was looking for. It didn't just happen through hard knocks, through, through discipleship, through life experience and how he responded by faith. His character was being shaped. This is why Paul says in Romans, we can rejoice when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. You see, our character is forged over time through a process. And I think that it's important for us to recognize that because so many of us think that the moment we become a Christian, life is going to be, uh, you know, a box of fluffy ducks. You know, the difference between um, life as a Christian and life as a non-Christian is that you're no longer facing it by yourself. You have a perspective that is different and you're not walking by sight, you're walking by faith, but you still got to walk it. But instead of seeing obstacles, you're seeing opportunities. And instead of seeing, uh, and instead of seeing things as barriers, you're seeing them as, as ways for your faith to be strengthened, for God to move, to reveal something of himself and through that something of, of what he wants to do in your life. And Paul says that if we try and, and, and live our life on the basis of an event, like, OK, I came to faith, that's it, then we're going to give up. We're going to miss the, the, the benefit that trials and persecutions bring into us to strengthen our character. You know, one of your best friends that you neglect is adversity. My best friend is adversity because adversity teaches me so much. It's because of adversity. It's because of trials. It's because of problems that I recognize those weaknesses in my life that God wants to work in so that I can be all he calls me to be. It's because of problems and trials and, and, and all those things that, that my character is shaped so that I become the husband that my wife needs the father that my kids need, the grandfather that my grandkids need, the pastor that the church needs, that I become the person that God wants me to be. It didn't happen on the 6th of April in 1986 when I became a Christian. That was the beginning and it's, my character is continuing to be forged through circumstance. Never underestimate the season in which you're in in terms of its ability to help shape your character. If you see character as something that just happens because faith just happens, then you're going to miss 
the opportunities that this current season that the world finds itself in presents. To allow yourself to become more like Christ. To allow yourself uh, to, to develop in those areas that God wants to develop uh, you, you in. There was this guy who was a um, he was a New Testament lecturer in the um, Southern Bible um, uh, Theological College, um, 1920 to 19, mid 1940s, I think. This guy guy's name is William Hershey Davis. He wrote this poem about called Reputation and Character. The circumstances amid which you live determines your reputation. The truth you believe determines your character. Reputation is what you're supposed to be. Character is what you are. Reputation is the photograph. Character is the face. Reputation comes over one from without. Character grows up from within. Reputation is what you have when you come into a new community. Character is what you have when you go away. Your reputation is learned in an hour. Your character does not come to light for a year. Reputation is made in a moment. Character is built in a lifetime. Reputation grows like a mushroom. Character grows like an oak. A single newspaper report gives you your reputation. A life of toil gives you your character. Reputations make you rich or make you poor. Character makes you happy or makes you miserable. Reputation is what men say about you on your tombstone. Character is what angels say about you before the throne of God. Isn't that powerful? Don't lose sight of those last two. Character makes you happy or makes you miserable. You see, if you treat faith as an event, your character is not going to be formed and you're going to be miserable. Hard times, pressure, persecution, anxiety is going to make you miserable. But if you see that as opportunity to yield to God and let him work in your life and to, to drive out some of those enemies that need to be driven out little by little, your character is being formed and you're going to be happy. Character is what the angels say about you before the throne of God. What is a reputation given to you by others matter compared to what the angels say? are going to declare before the throne of God. You see, our only way through COVID, your only way through anxiety, your only way through, 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 um, through the, the, the demands of social change and, and, and all of that means and all the, the, the frustrations and all of the, the tensions that that generates for us is not simply having Jesus come and change those people or change those circumstances. It's, it, it's come by recognizing these are opportunities for Christ to form his character in us. Because the more like Christ we become, the more effective our witness to Christ becomes. Don't just look at life and think, God, would you come and change that? Would you come and move in that situation? See it as an opportunity for God to develop the character of Christ in you so that people see Christ in you. Because if we can do that, it changes everything. If we're going to become the church that Jesus could see from the cross as he looked out and looked down through history, a church that is not overcome by the powers and principalities of, of, of this world, that is not overcome by, by enemies, by devils, if we're going to become everything he envisaged, we have to become more like Christ. And this is the type of character that Paul says heaven wants to form in us. The Holy Spirit wants to produce fruit in our lives. And fruit, you don't just plant fruit, you grow fruit with a seed that grows into a tree and then it blossoms and that fruit grows before it can be harvested. See, process. But this is the character. This is the process of developing this type of character. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. It grows like fruit. Doesn't come in an instant. Doesn't happen overnight. You see, the reason so many of us struggle with sin, the so many of us struggle with temptation, the so many of us struggle with life, is because the Jesus we fell in love with 
isn't the same Jesus that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John reveal to us in the scripture. You see, the Jesus, the, the Jesus that, that you met was your saviour. But the Jesus you need today has to be Lord. He has to be the one who, who shapes and moulds and directs and, and, and says, this is in, this is out, do this, don't do that. And unless we see faith as the process of getting from Saviour to Lord, we're going to go from event to event to event. And we're going to be disappointed. You can't live your faith on the basis of a decision that you made way back. That was the beginning. It was a mountaintop. But then you go down into the valley where your character is formed so you can come back up. Because here's the thing, not only is your character not f built in an instant, but forged over time. Gratitude, gratitude is built over time and not in an instant as well. You see, when there's significant or miraculous things happening around us, when God moves in our life, when we become, say yes to Jesus, gratitude it flows naturally. We're so thankful for him because he's, he's changed us. He's done something in us. We've seen a miracle. It's another thing, though, when we have to walk through suffering, when we have to walk through hardship, we have to walk through a relationship that appears broken beyond repair and let God begin to put the pieces back together over as painful as it is, as long as it takes. But it's in, those pro it's in that place that gratitude is formed. You see, I'm thankful to God when He heals me. I'm thankful to God when He does something miraculous. I'm thankful to God that He saved me. But my gratitude to him, which goes beyond mere thankfulness, is shaped by his, by his goodness and, and by the way he, he works in and through me despite me. The way that he carries me when I can't go on myself. The way that he picks me up again and again and again and again when I fall. The way that he says, you know what, <clears throat> we're going to get through this. This is not the end. The way that he shows me a glimpse of what is in front so that I can persevere through what I'm going through. That's where gratitude is formed. Gratitude is different from thankfulness. My gratitude is in response to his faithfulness. I'm thankful for his goodness. And, and finally, as we, as we draw this towards a close, as I think of Jesus standing there in Caesarea Philippi, and the stronghold of, of all of the gods of this world, the, as he stands before the gateway of Hades and says to Peter, who do you say I am? I'm left with this question. You know, it's easy to say that Jesus is Lord when we're in church, but who do you say he is in the workplace? You see, it's, it's easy to say that Jesus is Lord when we're, in, when we're around other Christians, but to stand where Jesus was standing when he asked Peter, when he's standing in the world, standing in that place where, where everything that is the opposite of God is, is rampant and unchecked, where attitudes, where behaviours, where viewpoints, where, where beliefs are at odds with faith. Who do you say Jesus is? And when I say that, I'm not simply saying, what is your declaration with your mouth? But how, how does the way that you live bear witness to Jesus as Lord? How do you live out of this in this place here? How do you take this Jesus as my Savior, Jesus as Lord, and live out in a way that begins to shape the world in which you live? As we open up the rest of the Gospel of Mark, this is what we're going to, to be wrestling with. How do we live out of the hope that we have as we go through the ups and downs of life in a way that bear testament to the fact that if Jesus is the Messiah, if he is the one who holds all things in the palm of his hand, he is before all things and in whom all things are held together. If he is truly Lord of our life, then how do we live out of that in response to adversity, 
in response to uh, persecution, in response to a world that is at odds with the kingdom of heaven. And so as you think about that, let me just wrap up. As always, I, I want to ask this question. What's one step you can take to apply this in your life? What's one step that you can take to begin to come to that place where the confession of Christ and the way you live become one and the same? Maybe for some of you, it's beginning to, to shift your thinking from faith as an event to faith as a process. You see, when it's, a, when it's an event, what happens is you go looking for things. You go from one church service to another. You go, from, you go looking for the healing service. You go looking through the, for the miracle worker. You go looking for a prophetic word. And there's nothing wrong with these. But these are means of building character, of strengthening faith. They don't, faith is not built on those events. Faith is strengthened through those events. You cannot live on the mountaintop. Nothing grows on the mountaintop. You've got to come down into the valleys. And maybe the first thing that for some of you is to, the step you can take is to begin to change and stop going from event to event and start seeing faith as a process every day. God, what do you want to do in my life? What do you want to change? That's why I encourage people when they read the scriptures to say, so what does this tell me about God? What does this tell me about myself? What must I do in response? Because every day is an opportunity for, for faith to build. We, maybe for some of you, it's where does God want to work in my life to build character? What have I been ignoring? What have I, what have I been avoiding? Whatever it is, I encourage you just to take some time and think, what's one thing I can start to do to close the gap between who I know Jesus is and, and what I say about him in church to how I live away from church? So that your life might be all that God has ordained it to be. That you would know the fullness of life that Jesus promised. That you might be able to declare with others that everything Jesus does is wonderful. So with that in mind, let me close and uh, I look forward to catching up with you next time. God bless. Thank you so much for that word, Pastor Hamish. I know I was very touched by it, so I'm sure that you all watching have been too. I just want to encourage you to really think about that last question that he asked us, is how you can apply that to your own life. So just take a few minutes before our service ends now to quickly jot down your th thoughts or even just keep them in your mind and answer that question of how you can apply everything that you've heard today into your personal life. But hey, that's us for today. Just a reminder that there is no Slido tonight. Um, we'll see you back for Slido next Sunday evening, 7.30 New Zealand time. But other than that, we'll see you soon. God bless.